Welcome back to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. I'm Richard Lawrence. Today, with our wonderful panel of experts and commentators both, we have Anna Jane Peril, Marianne March, and our special (laughs) guest, John Miltimore, Fee's Managing Editor. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You arrived on a uh, very uh, difficult week for us in the office because, of course, on Monday, Atlanta City Watershed actually announced that we needed to boil our water, which created all sorts of tumult in our fair city and in our office. Oh, yeah. It was... um I was unbothered by it um, in every sense because this happened. So I moved here from New Orleans um, and there, because it's a swamp city, it happens literally every week. I mean, we get a boil water advisory constantly. And so it got to the point that we were just like, I don't care anymore. I'm going to drink the water or whatever. Really? Yeah. You drank the water? Yes. Oh, yeah. I drank the water, bathed in it, brushed my teeth, did all the <laughs> stuff. And again, like no reports of anyone ever being affected by it. Not saying that it's not yeah. smart to avoid it. I'm just saying that it got to the point where it's kind of just wearing on us. Um, I mean, I'm specifically mad because here I, I went to Starbucks uh, in the morning and they were shut down because of because of the bo- water impossible. advisory. Yeah, it was very upsetting. Here's my question. Yeah. Who who followed the order, like, to, to a T and didn't oh, drink any Oh, water? I did. I, I was did terrified. Not. I did not. I did not either. Yeah. Yeah. I have never examined my water so closely, and I swear I saw things that I never want to see again. <laughs> did you actually see things in the water? It, there was cloudiness, and so I boiled my water, and I, I had a plan. I had a plan for specifically boiling, letting the water cool so I could brush my teeth, and then halfway through brushing my teeth, I forgot, and I used the, the tap water. And, and then you just wonder all night long mm-hmm. whether you have have something. So the whole the whole incident was based on a water pumping plant that had low pressure, and so they ended up taking some of the uh, water offline. Yeah. And in fact, on my street, there was some construction happening, the street where I live, there was some construction happening, and uh, in fact, they forgot to turn the water back on. So we were oh, no. without water at our house for probably oh, no. about seven hours until like 11 p.m., so uh, we just went to the you know neighborhood restaurant and had dinner with the neighbors and bought bottled water from across the street mm-hmm. at the grocery. All I had was LaCroix, and I didn't think that would be good to brush my teeth with. <laughs> no, that's probably <laughs> not the best idea. And so, you know, in this sort of uh, uh, rush to uh, d- either drink or boil or, you know, ponder the veracity of this uh, bottled or uh, uh, boil water advisory. There are also some other advisories that were given from the authorities, Mm -hmm. whoever they may be. In fact, we've recently come out of the great romaine lettuce debacle of 2018, where significant amounts of romaine lettuce were found to have E. coli. And so that caused so many restaurants to just totally throw out their supplies. Mm -hmm. I did follow that order. We did not buy any romaine lettuce. Well, I was kind of forced. I didn't even, I didn't know anything about it until I went to go get a Caesar salad and that was a huge problem. Um, And I know Caesar salads are near and dear to your Oh, they are. That's my favorite food. My favorite food. I love Starbucks and I love Caesar salads and um, the world's been messing with me this week, uh, for sure. Um, So you're the one. You're the cause. Yes. So they did pull it from stores entirely? You couldn't have if well, you okay. I don't know. No, that's what I was going to ask. Because oh. I, I only um, sad. I don't cook. So my reality is a restaurant told me I could not have it. Mm-hmm. That is the only way I knew this was going on. I just knew we were um, eating spinach lettuce with our tacos. I'm like, what's going on here? Okay. Yeah. Wait, so, so, did you, so did you buy romaine? In, no, you didn't. Like you no. saw it in stores, though. No, I, I don't know. My wife was okay. shopping and she's like, oh, we're going to have tacos. And she said, well, we can't because there's no romaine lettuce. I'm like, well, what about other stuff? And she's like, spinach? Yeah. I'm like, fine. Well, I read that the cost of other lettuces was doubling because Mm. romaine is obviously the preferred Mm. lettuce, if you can't have butter lettuce, I guess. But Mm. uh, I did read that some people got sick, that something like 43 cases of E. coli, E. coli-related illness, uh, were reported, and that a couple... Like That's about a dozen people went to the hospital. Yeah, no deaths from what I read from the CDC. But look, luckily for all the people listening, um, the lift has been formal. Uh, the ban has been formally lifted as of November 26th. Um, so I guess we're free again Hooray. to eat our romaine. Yeah. And so, did anyone at home have romaine that they threw away? No. I think we did. Yeah, I believe I believe we did. I don't cook mm-hmm. again, so I, don't I, know, I know a couple people who just kept eating it. And so that kind of yeah. brings up the question of, you know, what. How seriously do we take these kinds mm-hmm. of warnings? Well, I think that it's sometimes just hard to know where your food is coming from. And it seems like it was specifically from parts of California, maybe even Arizona, that the bad lettuce was coming from. Um, so I think it's just a question of, first of all, do we even know where our food comes from? If you're buying it in a restaurant, probably not. If you're right. buying it in the grocery store, maybe. Uh, so 
I don't, I, I err on the side of caution. You, you, you reckless devil may care people eating your lettuce and drinking your water. I'm on the opposite <laughs> side. I tend to be pretty skeptical of these and I, I really don't change my behavior. Now I will say it takes probably one bad experience and I yeah. might, might change. But, you know, I, I really don't pay much attention. Yeah, and I think for me, just sp specifically speaking to, like, the boil water advisory, for example, it's like when you when it happens over and over again, you start to become immune, I think, mm. or um, you sound it out, you know, or you tune it out. Um, so that's how I feel when it comes to warning. So it's not necessarily that I am, by my nature, skeptical. It is um, in practice over time I've become skeptical, you know, as a result of the so stimuli. So when you, when you lived in New Orleans and there were boil water advisories, mm practically every week, you said, what, how, was that the reaction of your friends as oh, well? Yeah. You were oh, all yeah. We were all like, whatever. Water? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. it just was a non-issue. Hmm. And yeah. so both of these alerts were issued by government agencies. Here in Atlanta, the watershed. Mm -hmm. And the CDC. I don't, CDC yeah. was the one that issued on the lettuce. Right. These are both government agencies, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we'll go back to that. But I wonder almost if, it weren't a warning from a government agency. Would that prompt each of you to kind of consider the warning more seriously or less seriously? Yeah, when you ask mm -hmm. that question, I feel yes. So if it were, for example, like if um, you know a company that that uh, sells produce, a private entity that sells produce, told everyone, told their customers, "Hey, this is happening," I would, I feel like that would, I would pay more attention certainly because it's like they would, they have an incentive to make sure that we're, that we want to buy their, mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is there's a bunch of incentives around kind of communicating the negative sides of a product. They want to make sure that they maintain our relationship with them. Um, so, and they want us to be safe. They don't want to be associated with sickness. So I almost feel like they're motivated mm -hmm. in this very specific way. Like, you know, like we always talk about motivating by profit matters when it comes to information and things like that. So I feel like I would definitely be I would tend to agree. Like I, I'd never thought about it before, but yeah, if, if a company told me, yeah, you might want to bu not buy our stuff right now, yeah, I'd yeah. be like, whoa, this is more serious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember a couple years ago, uh, beginning of 2016, when Chipotle, do you remember when Chipotle shut down for a day yes. or a couple of days yeah. to address mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. e, e. coli outbreak? And that, I think we all took that very seriously. Although they did get me back in the door a couple well, days like, later with a free burrito. Right, yeah. and that's the thing. Yeah, exactly. That's a great example. I think you're back. I mean, my relationship with Chipotle, despite that, is, yeah, is, is totally fine. Um, yeah. because I think that they were, yeah, it's interesting. So they gave you a free burrito yes, afterwards. in 2016, yeah. And then I had Chipotle yesterday, not not remembering about the romaine lettuce, and I had a little scare. I ate some <laughs> romaine, and I was like, oh, no, is this okay? <laughs> I was actually walking back from that restaurant the other night with my husband, Colin, and he mentioned, because our water wasn't turned on, do you think we're going to get a refund? I said, no, absolutely not. What incentive does the watershed have mm -hmm. to provide any kind of concession to us for an inconvenience yeah. such as yeah. this? Actually, I, doing some reading, I found that a study commissioned by the city of Atlanta found that a day without water in Atlanta has an economic impact of $250 million. Wow. What does that mean? It means that because of our inability to access um more affordable tap water people are then buying bottled water oh, and wow. and with businesses shutting down and I knew that at the Atlanta public schools were distributing bottles of water mm -hmm. and hand sanitizer to the children because they are held captive in their school. You're doing 250 million. Yes. Daily. Wow. I mean, yeah, with mm -hmm. all the businesses that shut down as, as a result of that, like I can't imagine how much Starbucks lost, like Starbucks Atlanta, um, mm -hmm. because of the because of the boil water. So we, do we believe example. that statistic? You know, I mean, the statistics that I have are all from the CDC and... Oh. Must be true. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that does end up making me wonder. It's a larger question. You know, at what point do we stop believing the authorities, right? So let's go back to the government warnings now. You heard mm -hmm. them every week in New Orleans mm -hmm. on the water, right? You just tuned them out. They became sort of the government that cried wolf. Mm -hmm. Here in Atlanta, we don't have it happen all that frequently. At least there is not a lettuce recall every month, right? Mm -hmm. So we're maybe not as immunized to these warnings. But at what point do we start saying that this is real versus just sort of some occasion for a government bureaucrat to cover their butt? Yeah, well, I do think that's often what it is, is that there's fear of backlash if they don't say anything. If there's no warning issued for for the potentially contaminated water, for the lettuce, and and somebody gets sick, then um, politicians and uh, civil servants don't want to be left holding the buck. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is this endemic? It seems to me today that when we talk about what we're hearing in the news media, what we're hearing from our president's direct Twitter feed, that it's possible we might be 
starting to feel a lot like you did in New Orleans. I mean, mm. w- this brings up the larger question. Who do we believe? If we can't believe when the president of the United States says he comes out from a meeting with China with a trade agreement with a promise by China to come out and buy a huge amount of mm-hmm. American-made goods, who can we believe? Well, and I think that this, this speaks to uh, an era we're in where with the internet, with things like Twitter, we all have a voice in a way that we didn't before. And so it is harder to navigate what is truth, what is fact. Um, I mean, and I think that you know, our president, the president of the United States being on Twitter and having the ability he's uncensored. He's just out there talking. He's his own press secretary. Nece- yeah. His not entire press department. Saying things that are accurate when he was talking about um, some of the, um, the the tear gas situation in Tijuana. He called it safe, safe tear gas or something. And everybody's just like, okay, you can just make things up mm. if you're just typing it out on your phone, you know? See, I guess I have a different perception. I tend to think of President Trump as mostly being honest, but honest from his perspective. I think that mm. he oh. genuinely thinks that he is honest. Um <laughs> I think, so, well, I think you're speaking to like the philosophical concept of honesty yeah. too. If you talk about truth, I mean, let's, you know, let's get heady, but really like truth is only, it's only in here. Um, and your perception mm-hmm. is what defines your truth to a degree. My question is when did we expect politicians to be honest? Yeah. I, I remember Mark question. Twain a long time ago, you know, kind of had a lot of, you know, funny things to say about you, know, you never trust a politician. They, we're kind of, we kind of expect them to fib yeah. to us a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Is it like when you ask the hairdresser if you need a haircut? Well, of course you need a haircut. Uh, so or how does this business. suit make me look? Do I look <laughs> fat in the suit or yeah, whatever it yeah, is? Yeah, of course yeah. you look great in that suit. So, you know, I guess there are some <laughs> white lies. But when you're talking about the president of the United States, then, you know, maybe you want it not to be his personal truth, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the whole notion behind having an entire group of people working for you in a presidential administration. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about expressing my personal truth. And in fact, there was a piece that our president, Larry Reed, had on the, our website, fee.org, a couple of days ago talking about personal truths. You know, I'm speaking my truth or she's speaking her truth. And he ends up opening the entire essay with a fabulous quotation by Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist. And he said, mankind are not held together by lies. Trust is the foundation of society. Where there is no truth, there can be no trust. And where there's no trust, there can be no society. So that's a Mm. big statement right there. Mm -hmm. Where there's no trust, there's no society. Are we drifting in a direction where if you can't trust who many people regard to be the paragon of trustworthiness, the representative of the nation, the president of the United States, are we in a precarious situation? Yes. No, it's one of those things. The, the John, Atlantic, to state the Atlantic the- <laughs> had a great article on this. I don't remember if it was earlier this year or last year, but it said, and it was all about the trust in America that's collapsing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Trump's, I'm sure, part of the problem on his Twitter. He doesn't. He's on Twitter. You, Twitter's not a thoughtful forum, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You just kind of speak what's on your mind. Well, you're very limited. It's only 280 characters. 140, I think. Used right? to be 140. Or, they doubled oh, it, but it's yeah, still did. Okay. two sentences. All right. Um, yeah. But but yeah. I so and, and so that's part of the problem. Um, but I think there's there's the ph- philosophical issue as well, uh, moral relativism that says, well, we, we do kind of have our own truth, which is kind of a preposterous idea, I think. Um, there, you know, it, it sort of self-contradicts itself. Um, it reminds me of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He said, we all may be entitled to our own opinions, but we're not all entitled to our own facts. But it seems mm-hmm. today that the way that we're going, that we are be- beginning to think that we do have our own facts. Yeah. Well, there is so much conflicting uh, reporting that's going on. Um, any Pick an issue and you can find something to support yourself online. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that there's a lot of noise. And the way I kind of see it is that we all just have to take responsibility for, for ourselves and, and for being informed, even though that's difficult because there's limited hours in the day. And I assume we all have jobs and hobbies and things to do. Well, I think, and like I said earlier, I think that we've got a couple of things that have influenced this, I think, this era we're in, which is the internet um, and access access information is at an all-time high and being able to express yourself is at an all-time high and having Mm -hmm. a forum to talk about how you feel and what you think is is the most available it has ever been in the history of our nation. We all have a lot of voice. Yes, and in in, in civilization in general. 
And I think that it also came to a head when you see what this last election looked like. It was no longer it was no longer a battle of facts. It was it was it was so polarizing from an emotional standpoint. You're talking about 2016 yes, presidential. Yes, I'm talking about. I feel like ever since then it has become. I mean, we we truly it, it uh, eroded how we perceive fact um, so fundamentally, and then and and kind of in the mm-hmm. wake of that, we are just kind of left um, to to gather in tribes very passionately. Media has changed mm-hmm. a lot, right? We've come a long way from Walter Cronkite, you know, reading the nightly news. The um, most trustworthy man in America. And everyone trusted Walter. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it was, but it was more straight news, just the facts. Yeah. And now news is blending into so much opinion it's as so well. so emotional now. And, yeah. and there is that war between, between the media and Trump where it's very antagonistic. And it, mm-hmm. it is hard. Mm-hmm. Like, you look and you, it's hard to figure out what to believe today. And so if you yeah. can't believe the president all the time when he's tweeting, can you believe his critics? No. Uh, no. And I'll read just... John very, with the very, second no. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Since it, was, it, was, it was a great quote from George Orwell that he wrote um, in the 40s. Um, and it, it was, you know, Orwell worked as a reporter um, during the, the, Spanish, uh, uh, the Spanish War. And he was speaking with a friend. And here's his quote. He said, history stopped in 1936. Um, or I'll, I'll go back. I remember saying once to Arthur Kessler, History stopped in 1936, at which he nodded in immediate understanding. We were both thinking of totalitarianism in general, but more particularly of the Spanish Civil War. Early in life, I've noticed that no event is ever correctly reported in the newspaper. But in Spain, for the first time, I saw newspaper reports which did not bear any relation to the facts, not even the relationship which is implied in an ordinary lie. Um, and, and he goes on to say, lie. Yeah, uh, he goes on to say, and I, I, for a long time I tried to understand what he was saying. I think he was saying objective truth died and everything became propaganda. We're all fighting for our own version of the truth. Mm. Um, and it, it was pretty insightful. And I think, you know, 70 years after he said it, we're, we're seeing we're all fighting for our own version of the truth. You know, Larry, in his essay where he's talking about his truth versus her truth versus their truth, he writes also, one of the telltale signs of moral decline, one that if left unchecked will ultimately portend civilizational collapse, so he's not messing around here, is a careless, cavalier, and subjective attitude toward the truth. When a people value truth for its own sake and seek to establish and uphold it, then other critical values fall into place, such as justice, trust, fairness, civility, and honor. And so he's putting a lot of weight on the importance of an objective truth, which it seems today, just given everything that's happening politically, everything that's happening geopolitically around the world, everything Mm -hmm. that's happening with the rapidity of the news cycle, which I used to consider myself a news junkie, and I don't even know what's happening from minute to minute anymore. Everything seems to be going that much faster, and we're all needing to respond to it that much more quickly, and we then respond to it with our own interpretation, which doesn't seem to be any less valid than the interpretation of the President of the United States. And, you know, I, I think it's more important than ever because of that to say, am I willing to challenge my own assumptions? Mm-hmm. What, I, what I believe is true, am I willing to test that? Um, and I think a lot of us would say yes, but 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 do we really? Yeah. Um, and it, it's a challenge to do that. Well, and I think yes, and everyone. I mean, when you talk about when you talk about a value based conflict, it's absolutely one of the hardest things to do is to let go of how you perceive something. Um, and mm-hmm. like they say, intelligence this uh, intelligence is being able to hold two two opposite ends of an argument in your head at the same time, <laughs> um, which I very very much agree with. Um, so I think that part of that is being able to accept that perhaps you are wrong. The seed mm-hmm. of doubt should remain in in all observations and fact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think it's hard to to think critically because for me, I think I need to start from a foundation of understanding of having of having knowledge of the facts and and from multiple sources and it's just difficult it's difficult to push to push myself to to check out different sources and and then to question my beliefs i don't know if you guys have any strategies well i mean so we're now away from an age of fact and mm-hmm. now in an age of emotionalism, right? We're mm-hmm. all feeling what our own personal truth is. Mm-hmm. And I guess to Marianne's question, sort of, whose responsibility is it to actually navigate this? Is it on us? Is it on Facebook to develop the most miraculous algorithm ever devised by the mind of mankind to figure out how to 
separate fact from fiction, how is a computer going to know? Yeah. Yeah. Anything algorithm-based kind of creeps me out a little bit. When, when things get flagged by an algorithm and says, nope, we're not, that one doesn't, doesn't pass. It has the, the wrong photo. Um, and in general, I, I think this idea of suppressing speech is very dangerous. Um, it, it, of course, it's the most dangerous when it's the government doing it. Um, but even the social media channels, um, you know, there's the great idea by John Stuart Mill where he talks about um, free speech is how we get to truth. You, you have, mm -hmm. okay, you don't, you disagree, you challenge one another, you discuss. Um, and that's why I think there is a danger in, in trying to label things as fake news and flag them and suppress not just yeah. that, but the entire site. The people who are uh, a news site or a, or a, a brand because they're saying things that, that um, you, you say are untrue or that violate your standards. What's the danger of a society that has this notion so embedded as it seems to be in ours of fake news. What does that lead to? It becomes a scapegoat uh, that we can all use to, to say that, to continue to maintain our beliefs, is that that's fake news, that's, that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. Just shut out yeah. contradictory opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or um, facts. Yeah. 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 I mean, I look um, at some of the things that uh, certainly the Russian government did not originate, they didn't invent. But some things like their newspaper, their main newspaper is called Pravda, which in Russian means truth. And so many articles in that are pure propaganda from mm -hmm. the Kremlin, which is the, the seat of power in, in the Russian government. And so Russians just kind of accept everything as fake news and they just sort of shrug and they wonder if nothing's real, why should I care about it, right? So it removes not only a trust in the media, not only a trust in the ability to get to the truth, but also agency from people mm. where they can't actually plan a way to improve their own life and the lives of, of those people in their country. I mean, are we teetering on that sort of uh, f fake news sort of ambivalence that it seems to be is in other places in the world? What would that mean for us? Well, I think we'll always have, I mean, I think we will have the problem of too many voices all the time. Now, I don't know how that's going to stop. Just but a I think filtering event, problem. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that it, we are going to have to get better at that, at the filtering component. Um, but, I, but I fear that when I say that, I think, like you said, find multiple sources. Find multiple sources, hear multiple sides of an argument that you, you want to know about, um, and then continue to build relationships with the sources you trust, because trust is critical. But mm -hmm. I, I fear that when, when I say that, to some people they hear, well, there are, there are certain outlets that I just like because they're saying it how I like it, and then that's trust. That's the trust mm -hmm. they build. And so I, I don't know how to combat that. It's an important question. Do humans want truth? Yeah. You know, there, there's a great quote, um, you know, humans can't handle very much reality, which is saying, like, humans can't handle the truth very yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, they, what do they do? They go to the media that kind of confirms their biases. Exactly. And confirms what exactly. they want to think. Yeah. And you can't make people want to want the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, generally speaking, I think people prefer entertainment to actual truth. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why we have the kind of new news media we have today is that what if it bleeds, it leads. We're going for the, the stuff that keeps people watching. I do really like Kylie Jenner. So yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Entertainment. Yeah. So where do we go from here? We have a situation mm -hmm. wherein trust seems to be eroded. Facebook and YouTube and Google are all trying their own approach. Eventually there will be legislation on this, whether we like it or not. Uh, what's, what's the prognosis as we end 2018 and go into 2019 for truth in this country? I'm going to leave that world? to you guys because my answer will be too pessimistic. Oh, so, I was going to say, so, I, that's a tall order, Richard. I don't know if really you want to ask just us three. That's a tough, that's a tough question. I don't know. Well, so Marianne, let's help yeah. us out. What do you got? Um, well, I guess I'll just share my, my tactic that I use to, to try to stay informed and hopefully uh, parse out some truth from entertainment. Um, and that is I, I make it a point uh, every morning to listen to NPR and Fox News. I seek out the Young Turks and Ben Shapiro mm. just so I feel like I'm getting a... A somewhat, a somewhat thorough mm -hmm. range of, of information and opinions. And, and I, and I do feel like that's almost the best I can do because there are a limited number of hours in the day and I, I have things that I need to do like work and, uh, and avoid lettuce, I guess. Hmm. So, um, so your truth your advice, in 2019, huh? <laughs> yeah. Your advice is to seek out, I guess, the range of these different sources mm -hmm. to see what they're saying about, yeah. 
the and same I, subject and I guess different subjects. And I really would encourage everyone to do that because I think that the alternative is – there's maybe two alternatives. You either try to get a broad range of, of information or you listen to a couple of, a couple of sources – or you try not to consume any news whatsoever. And I think that last strategy is the worst because stuff is filtering through because, because news is entertainment and you can't scroll through Facebook or Twitter without coming across something. So even, mm -hmm. even friends I have who are not political and do not stay abreast of current events, they, they still stuff gets through and then they're at the mercy of whoever. If Somebody. nothing else, you won't be able to understand the Saturday Night Live cold opens. That's the the only reason I watch the news. I mean, yeah. I, I think we need a, a, a free Other speech renaissance. Fun. It really, and if you look, the support for spe free speech is declining, and, and that's concerning. Um, but if we can, you know, look at free speech and realize how important it is, we let these ideas do battle, and we challenge ourselves, and 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 don't be afraid to expose ourselves uh, to ideas that challenge our own. And I truly believe if we do let the ideas contest, we are going to get closer to truth. You have a lot of people now on college campuses who think that it's important to insulate people from different opinion, that it's important to establish a mm -hmm. bubble that can protect folks from contradictory opinion. And that's one approach, right? The other approach is what you're saying, which is allowing those ideas to battle an open forum and to have at each other, which has always been sort of the classical liberal approach to the problem of difference of opinion, difference of experience in a society. And, and mm -hmm. in this case, it seems to me like there's an institutional crisis, right? Not only is the government no longer seen to be credible, at least as it used to be by most people, not only is the new news media not as credible as it used to be, um, but everyone sort of, again, tries to go back to their own premises, tries to reaffirm their own biases. And the only way to really combat that is to allow those biases to come out in open open debate. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the, one of the major networks has the uh, lean in as, as their catchphrase. That's what we need to do. We need to lean in, but lean in, but do it respectfully and not be afraid of anyone's ideas and say, we're, we're all mature adults. We can talk about these things um, in a rational way. I think it's a little easier said than done, especially the rational adult part. Well, that, that, I, I'm not saying it's easy, but yeah. yeah. Well, like, yeah, I mean, maybe just for our part, celebrate stories of that, of that, um, of a, including both sides to an opinion or coming to the table with people you disagree with. Um, what's that video we have on Fee? Um, you know, the uh, David, oh, what's his name? You know, the man who interacted with the, the African-American man who interacted with the Klansman. Yeah. And yeah, that's, what, what's his name? I don't remember, but that video is so amazing. We'll, 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 no, we'll put story. it in the comments just because yeah. that's it's an important such a piece. Good, to me, that's a good example of we need to tell the stories of people who, who do um, shed their, their biases and their, their value system informed identities um, to make change. And that's really important. And so this gentleman mm -hmm. you're talking about engages, he's a black or an African-American man, he yeah. engages with people who are KKK members, and he actually sits down and, and mm -hmm. talks to them, right? So, With the purpose of understanding. Wh with, where are they yeah. coming from, right? Mm -hmm. Don't try to go in and change their mind immediately. That'll happen, and that's what's happened with many Klansmen who he's engaged with. He's actually persuaded them that, you know, there's actually a lot of value in, in talking with people who are of different experiences, different backgrounds, ethnic mm -hmm. as ethnicities, and, and whatnot. Yeah. I, I think it's an important message. I mean, the Christian tradition does call for us to love our enemy. We don't, we don't ostracize them. We, we, we don't always have to agree on things, but we engage each other, yeah. even if our ideas are different. And I think um, that message is, is a, bit, a little bit lost today, and we need to, to bring that back. And so what happens in 2019? If you were to put on your prognostication hat mm. and imagine what exactly the state of truth and the age of emotionalism is as we go into the new year in just a couple of weeks here, are we in a better shape? Are we going to have a mass exodus from, you know, cable news and, and social media for people who are all upset with the lack of truth and clarity on those media? Or mm -hmm. is it more of the same? I suspect that it gets worse before it gets better. Yeah. Uh, short term, <laughs> I, I think it is yeah. going to be that because we're mm -hmm. kind of in the silly season. We already have presidential politics that's getting ramped up. Mm -hmm. um, long term, I think the outlook is a little bit brighter. So what happens? How do we, is it just the pendulum swinging back? What makes it better? 
I think so. I, I think that eventually we will see. So like you said, I think it's going to get worse and then something's got to give. I don't think that this is a sustainable yeah. way that we all talk about fact right now. We remember it's the core principles, um, you know, to your, to your question. I think we remember the principles um, that that helped us get where we are and remember that those are important. The, the classical liberal ideas that we've kind of, you know, there we, it was a pendulum and we, we, we swung a little too far. We need to settle back mm -hmm. in. And I, th I think that can that can happen. Yeah. And I, th I think that long term, you're right. I think long term it does it does get better because I think the baby in the bathwater here is the fact that we are getting opinions and information from people who who have been silent just by virtue of maybe not having a platform. And now and now they do with the mm -hmm. Internet. So long term, I'm hopeful. Short, short term. I'm not buying any stock in newspapers, I'll tell you that. So we just need to ride it out and <laughs> and hope that it gets better and work ourselves to make it better too. The by 60s our own probably example. looked pretty rough at the time yeah. too. And you know, things yeah. settled down after mm -hmm. that. And somebody in the office actually mentioned, "Boy, you think today's bad. The, the 60s were worse." And I was a little surprised to hear that. Mm -hmm. I, and I, but I was encouraged to hear we, that. We can lose sight of the past too, and it's important for us to remember that we've recovered from from sometimes worse things. So we'll have to leave it here for now and uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. We'll see you next week on the FeeCast. And be sure to find us on Spotify, on Google, and on Apple because you don't have to be looking at our beautiful smiling faces all the time. You can listen to all of our commentary on audio only as you're in the car, on a jog, whatever. Check us out on those platforms. We'll see you next week on the FeeCast.